Father, tonight we gather here to praise you because you are worthy of our praise. We declare that you're, you are a God who is great, a God who is loving, a God who has rescued us from our sin and our despair and our destruction, and you have claimed to us as sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. And Lord, tonight we want to praise you. We want to celebrate your goodness from whatever season of life we're in. We want to tell you thank you for loving us, for saving us, for giving us life. And and Lord, tonight we, we simply ask as the broken people who are struggling to live in your victory as as those who are, who are facing uh, the struggles of life, who are facing our own personal failures, our own personal mistakes, reaping the, well, reaping the results of the choices that we have made. Father, we ask that you would speak into our lives, that as we open up our ears and our hearts, that your spirit would take the truth of the word and apply it and change us, that we might truly celebrate the victory that is ours Because you are here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app uh, on your device, then grab one of the Bibles that's in the pews around you and uh, turn to page 1250. 1250. Uh, By the way, if you need a Bible then feel free to take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, use the Word of God, let it be part of your life because we know God will change your life uh, if you read it. Hey, we are kicking off a new uh, series tonight simply called Contentment. Uh, and, uh, and so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, if you'll find that. Hey, where is the most peaceful, restful, soothing place you've ever been? You know, that, that place that... That stress can't penetrate, that when you're there, the anxiety just ebbs away into sweet peace. Got a place in your mind? Take about 30 seconds and share it with your neighbor. Ready, set, go. Okay, some of you aren't really sharing. You're just kind of sitting there staring at, some, some of you are staring at your Bibles. You're like, I know the answer is in the scriptures. What is it? Hey, I, you know, I was expecting some of you to like start planning trips together uh, by the time you're, you're done. See, my place is, is Hawaii. Um, it had been 16 years after we got married for Merelda and I took our first real vacation and it was to Hawaii and I can't even describe for you how that felt uh, just being there. It was just like all that stress and just kind of decompressed and just kind of went away and I was like, ah, oh, I could stay here forever and Merelda's like, no, I can't. It's too far from the kids and uh, there's water everywhere. So, uh, but anyway, it was, it's just that, it's that place uh, that uh, uh, is so relaxing. And today we are kicking off a new series talking about contentment. And uh, contentment is that elusive characteristic of life that all of us desire, but we kind of struggle to achieve. Uh, And I say all of us desire, I'm assuming that everybody wants to be content. Is anybody here who strives to live in discontent? (laughs) I I didn't think so. It wasn't anybody last service either. So we want this thing called contentment. Contentment. and, and what's interesting is we live in a world, in a society that is built on discontent. You ever think about that? We are told over and over and over again that we need to improve or upgrade every part of life, right? Because we need whiter teeth and better hair, or at least a different color, right, ladies? And we need new clothes and a better car. And we need to make more money so that we can upgrade our house and eat better food, except when we indulge in those better desserts. And uh, we got to travel to exotic places, stay in amazing resorts, work less and play more so that we can end up on the beach in a Corona commercial. (laughs) Right? I mean, and they are selling that whole image of, you know, relaxation and contentment perfectly in that in that uh, commercial, and they even have that slogan now that people are going to find your beach. See, contentment, we want to achieve it, and sometimes we wonder if it's even possible. 
You know, maybe you're here tonight and life is wonderful for you. Maybe it is in that place where you can't believe how blessed you are and you can't believe how, how God has just worked in your life and you're living uh, proof of contentment and thanksgiving. And maybe you're not. Maybe you're here and, and uh, when people ask you how you're doing on the outside, you answer, fine, I'm happy, I'm content. But on the inside, you're seething. You don't know what's wrong. You don't know why you're not happy. You don't know why you're not content. And, and you're thinking about crazy things. You're thinking about a new job. You're thinking about moving to a new place. You're thinking about trading in your spouse. You're thinking about trashing your family. I, I mean, you're, you are. Maybe some of you are even thinking, like, what's the point of life because the way I feel? Uh, and you wonder, is this thing called contentment even possible? The Apostle Paul says that it is. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. And by the way, Paul is writing this from prison. He's writing this having been in prison several years. Uh, and, and his prospects do not look good for getting out. Here's what he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly... That now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You guys ever heard that last verse before? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, you know, we've, we, we know that verse, right? We love that verse. I could ask, how many of you have it like, you know, plastered someplace in your house, right? Uh, used to. Oh, we got used to. Hey, why is it that, every, you know, I'm, I see, I would bet that like, you know, 20% of you have it in your bathrooms. Why do we always put scripture verses in our bathrooms? You ever wondered that? Uh, it just occurs to me when I'm in people's bathrooms. Like, oh, nice verse. Why is it here? Um, so uh, <laughs> is that where we pray? Is that where we do our devotions? I, I don't know. It doesn't matter as long as you do them. So you know the verse. You love the verse. Maybe it's some of your favorite verse. I can do all things through him who, who strengthens me. But did you know the context that it was in? Were, did, were you aware that this verse is all about contentment? That, that Paul is wrapping up his saying uh, of I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength uh, in the context of saying it about being content in any circumstance that he's in. Because uh, that's what Paul's saying. He goes, look, I've been in prison and I've been free. I I've been abused and I've been blessed. I've had plenty to eat. And I've gone hungry. And, and I've learned the secret of being content in any of these circumstances. It's because of Jesus. He gives me the ability to do that. And in fact, I can do anything because he gives me the ability to do that. Now, when we take hold of this verse, it is a life-altering concept. If we really understand this passage and we go, hey, wait, this applies to my life. If the Apostle Paul learned the secret of being content in any circumstance, I can learn it too. So, first of all, let's talk about what is contentment. Before we go any further, because uh, we may have different definitions, and let's at least uh, agree on some things. First of all, the dictionary says contentment is being satisfied with what one is or has. Being satisfied with what one is or has. Kind of sounds like Paul, doesn't it? Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. There it is. He says, look, I, it doesn't matter. I, I am content. I'm satisfied with what I am and what I have. That's the, the, that's the straightforward dictionary, secular definition of contentment. Resonates with scripture. Now, in the biblical context, I would describe contentment as being joyful and at peace wherever you are. Being joyful and at peace wherever you are. So whether it's good times or bad times, whether you're winning or losing... When life is a breeze or life is a struggle, we are still people of joy and people of peace. That's what contentment looks like. Now, please don't answer this out loud, uh, but is that you? According to the dictionary or according to scripture, is that you? 
Are you living a contented life? Now, I hope that that's a question that you will wrestle with. You and God have a conversation because, it, you know, I, I don't want you to blurt out an answer and try to tell me because it doesn't matter what you say to me at this point. This is something but you and God know the truth. And, and in the course of this series called Contentment, I hope that you will continue having this conversation with God about your inner sense of being. Are you at peace with who you are? Are you at peace with where you are? Now, understand, as we're talking about contentment, contentment is not complacency. It is not laziness. It is not apathy. It is not giving up and being fatalistic, just like with whatever happens, happens. That, that's not what contentment is. I mean, you can be driven and be content. You can want to achieve and be content. You can, you, you can have goals for life and still be content. So contentment is not just checking out and saying, uh, I'm, it's not about me and I'm just, I'm done. It's not just putting life on cruise control and stop trying. Contentment is being at peace with God. Being at peace with yourself and being at peace with your circumstances so that you can offer honest praise to God. You're right, so we just sang a song that said, I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No matter the season of life, I will bring praise to God. I will celebrate his goodness because he's with me. Now, now, we sang that, and it's easy to sing the words. But see, contentment is meaning those words in our life. Being at peace with God, being at peace with yourself and your circumstances. Now, earlier, I asked you about your favorite place of peace and contentment. Uh, part of our discontent is that we uh, have been trained by our society to put too much emphasis on the tangible things of the external world in terms of contentment. Contentment is not a destination, no matter what the beer commercial says. Contentment is not a destination. It is a Christ-like attitude on the journey. You see, most of us here are followers of Jesus. And that means that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead. And we have made a commitment with our lives to follow Jesus. And because of that, the only destination of contentment is a place called heaven. We're not going to get there until we die. That's kind of the rules. Okay, I didn't make them. That just happens. The point of a man wants to die, then judgment. So while we walk this earth, our contentment is not going to be found in a destination or an achievement or a success. It's going to be found in the person of Jesus, following him on this journey. That's why we can do all things through Jesus who gives us strength, right? That's why Paul's saying this. Look, it's not about the place. It's not about the stuff. It's not about how much or how little. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. So back to the question, are you living a contented life? Um, we can, Paul said so, which means that you can live a contented life. No matter where your life is, no matter the mistakes you've made, e even if you're sitting here thinking there's no way that God can redeem how stupid I've been, yes, he can. God can redeem it. He can build your life back together. He can, he can take you and put you together. And he can help you to arrive in, in that, uh, at the end of the journey, living a contented life. So, that said, let's talk about the secret of being content, if you will. How do we grow in contentment? What are these things that Paul is talking about that will help us to, to become more and more content as we apply them to our lives? Because that's really what it's about. It's about hearing some things that, that Paul learned and starting to practice them and apply them to us. So how do we grow in contentment? Paul learned to be content in every situation. We can too. It begins when we accept God's plans. It begins when we accept God's plans. God's plans are better for me than my plans. God's plans are better for me than my plans. Uh, I've, I've figured this out over the course of years because uh, God has had me do some things that were contrary to my plans. 
Like when I finished seminary and I was certain that I was going to go be a pastor someplace out west or someplace up north, someplace far away from the deep south because there was tons of Baptist churches in the south and they didn't need me, but I was going to go someplace where I was needed by God. Didn't realize that God had people everywhere already. He didn't need me anywhere. So... Uh, so at the end of my journey of, uh, you know, after you know, graduating seminary, the only place that offered me a job was a church in South Georgia, in Albany, Georgia. And I went there because I knew God was leading me there. And, uh, and I had to eat my words because I had said publicly, repeatedly, many times, I will never be a youth pastor in the Deep South. And I went to be a youth pastor in the Deep South because God's plans are better for me than my plans. And I just had no clue what God wanted to do. But God wanted to teach me some stuff that I needed to learn desperately. And he wanted to introduce me to some people that would in turn bless me. Because it was in Albany, Georgia that I met Chet Anderson. And, uh, and see, so God has this plan that's a lot bigger than what I think, and his plans are better. Uh, God's plans are better for me than my plans. Then, from Georgia, he brought me to this little church in Lake Havasu City called Calvary Baptist Church. And, uh, and, and so my plan was to come here, never been a pastor before, make a few mistakes, learn some stuff, and then move on in three or four years to a real church in a real city someplace. <laughs> hey, I'm just telling you what my stupid plans were, Okay. God's plans are better for me than my plans are. And now when I look back at my life uh, I, and I look at Scripture, I understand that. Because Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells us that his plans are better. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Duh. That does not in there. That's just my, how it applies to me. So when I look back at my life, I can clearly see that God's plans are better than my plans. It's, it's a no-brainer. And because I've seen that, because I understand that, going forward, I will trust that his plans are better than my plans. So I'll still make plans, but I'll say, okay, God, here's my plans. And if that's what you want me to do, great. And if not, change them because yours are better than mine. So how do I know that God, what God's plans are for me? Ultimately, they're in this book. They're in this book. Now, a lot of times we think about plans in terms of where am I supposed to live and who am I supposed to marry and what am I supposed to do for a job. But really what God's most interested in is how we are going to live our lives. Not where we're going to live our lives. I mean, if, if he wants us someplace, he will move you. Trust me. But, but what God's mostly interested in is how we live our life. That we live a life of character. That we live a life that represents Jesus to the world. That we live a life that blesses other people. And so as we seek to learn God's way of living from this book, as we seek to apply his word to our lives, what happens is God starts blessing our life. And we discover that his plans are better than our plans. So do you believe that? Do you believe that God's plans are better than your plans? Yes. <laughs> some of you do, some of you maybe. So let me ask you, do you really believe that God's plans are better than your plans? Yes. Okay, then look at the person next to you and tell them, God's plans are better than your plans. <laughs> now, see, some of you cracked up when you said that. See, and, and, and here's the thing. We're in here and we're laughing. We're going, this is great. God's plans are better than my plans. Or God's plans are better than your plans. How are you going to feel when you walk out of the door and your plans don't work out? See, because that's what's going to happen. You do realize this, right? This is what's going to happen. In your mind right now, you've got a plan for what's going to take place tonight. You've got a plan for what's going to happen tomorrow. Down the road, you've got plans. And, and you've, you're kind of thinking this is the way life should happen. And it's not going to happen the way that you want it to. And that's where this whole thing about accepting God's plan works out. His plan is better than yours. So when your plan doesn't work out, are you okay saying, God, I trust you to redeem this? I trust you to fix my mistakes. I trust you to correct my path. I trust you in the midst of my plans falling apart and going to pieces. I trust you to redeem my life and to bless me. That's what it means to accept that God's plans are better than yours. And, and you have to do that if you really want to grow in a contented life. 
So you got to accept God's plans, and then you need to embrace God's priorities. So often, we live discontented lives because our priorities are off balance. Uh, is it any fun to drive a car where the wheels are really out of balance? <laughs> You're going to kind of notice that, aren't you? And it's going to drive you to distraction. It's going to ruin the tires quickly. It's going to be an uncomfortable ride. And yet, that's what a lot of us are doing with life. We are traveling down the road of life completely and totally out of balance. We, we prioritize being successful. We prioritize, you know, acquiring wealth and possessions of building our image and our business. We prioritize being right and winning arguments. And then we wonder why we're miserable, even when we achieve all the things we think we want. Discontent. But if we embrace God's priorities, we'll find contentment. So what is God's number one priority? You ever think about that? What is most important to God? What does God want us to value over everything else? Here's my answer. You can argue with it if you want. Uh, but I think I've got some biblical stuff to back it up with. I think the most important thing to God is people. People. Genesis 1 says that you and I were created in the image of God. We're the only part of creation that was created in his image. Uh, the Psalms say that, that God thinks about you more often than there are grains of sand on the seashore. Wow, that's kind of significant. Scripture tells us that, that Jesus came into this world, Paul said it this way, Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's me and you. In other words, God's mission was to save us from our sins. And that's why Jesus came. In fact, when Jesus was here, even before he suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sins, what did he say? The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And we were lost. We were in darkness. And, and Jesus came to bring us into the light. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And Jesus came to forgive us and move us into life. See, People, relationships, that's what's most important. Relationship with you is what matters to God. Um, and first of priority, if you will, is our relationship with the living God. The very most important relationship you can have is your relationship with God. That's why Jesus said, the first and great commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. To love God with everything that you are. Okay, think about this. If this is part of the, the priority of God, and this is how we're going to find contentment, if we embrace his priorities, how much effort, how much intentionality are you putting into your relationship with God? I, I mean, if this is it, you know, an hour a week, then, you know, how content are you going to be? If you want to grow in contentment, pursue a relationship with the living God because he is pursuing a relationship with you. This is the most mind-boggling truth. It ought to just make us stand up and cheer the fact that the God of all creation wants a personal relationship with every one of us. So much so that he sacrificed his one and only son to redeem us from our sins. And scripture says that when we believe in him, he adopts us as sons and daughters of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That means you're part of his family. That's how much God wants a relationship with you. He's like, it's not just good enough for us to be friends. You're my kids. You guys are kind of crazy about your kids, aren't you? You kind of like them. Grandkids, got a great, great grandkid back there. You're kind of crazy about them. That's how God is about us. He wants that relationship with you. And, and, and if you want to be content, then that needs to become a priority in your life. So have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus? If not, that's where the journey of contentment begins. That's where it begins. Secondly, if relationship is what matters most, then we've got to finish that verse because, you know, first and great command is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your closest neighbor? You ever think about that? See, some of you right now are going, see, Bob is this, he's like over here, and Jim's over here. I'm not sure which one's actually closer. Let me give you a clue so you don't answer this question wrong. Your closest neighbor lives in your house. 
with you. And right now, some of you are going, there's somebody living in my house? No. It's your family, okay? They're your neighbor. That's where it starts. So if I want to be content, this is, this is how it applies to me. If I want to be content, then I need to be the very best husband and father that I can be to my family. If I want to be content, I tr- need to try and be the husband that God created me to be and that my wife deserves me to be. If I want to be content, then I need to strive to be that person, not try to get my wife to become what I want her to be. Right? Because see, a lot of times we go into a relationship and we think, wow, they're really a wonderful person, and after a few years with me, they'll be perfect. <laughs> right? Because I will just get to, I'll change these few habits, and I'll, and I'll get them to start believing this and doing this differently, and pretty soon they will be my perfect and wonderful little puppet instead of a partner. Let me just tell you something. If you're thinking that if your husband or wife just changed a little bit, you'd be happy, you'd be content, you you are on the road to disaster in your relationship. That's a recipe for discontent. It's not going to live long. You see, your spouse is flawed Just like you're flawed. Because you're both sinners. And if you want to have a contented relationship, then instead of looking at them and seeing all of their flaws and how they should change and how they could do this and they could do that to meet my needs better, what you need to do is look in the mirror and say, okay, God, I'm flawed and and it must be tough to live with me, so help me to be the person that you want me to be. And if you focus on being the person that God created you to be, of loving your spouse the way that Christ wants you to, then everything in your relationship is going to change and you are going to be far more content. Same thing with your kids. Stop looking at them and thinking, I'll be content if my kids succeed or do this or do that or, or, or make A's or whatever. Just look at them and say, how do I become the parent that they need? How do I bless them? You see, if we're not investing in our relationships with God and with our neighbors, then we're not going to find contentment. It's just going to elude us. If you want contentment, If you want to grow in contentment, accept God's plans, embrace God's priorities, and finally, practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. You know what I've noticed? Contented people are thankful. And thankful people are contented. But complaining is evidence of discontent. Never notice that? Now, I'm not advocating, I never would advocate a life with no critical thinking. Uh, we're always trying to improve here at Calvary. We, we want the, everything to be better. And so to get better, we have to be honest about our performance. Every, it's not all sunshine and roses and stuff. Sometimes we have to be brutally honest. But in the midst of that, we are always grateful for the privilege of serving God. And we are incredibly thankful for the people that would serve God with their gifts. This, this place runs on volunteers. You are amazing people in the way you serve. And... and, and We rejoice, in the midst of all this, we sit back and rejoice in lives that are being changed through the power of Jesus Christ. It it is wonderful. Uh, But uh, if you're someone who's full of gratitude, keep it up. And you know who you are, because right now you're just sitting here and you're writing notes and you're you're drawing little doodles of sunshine and bunnies and (laughs) flowers. And you are like, this is such a great sermon. I'm so thankful for this sermon. I'm so th- God's speaking to me and convicting me. And, I just, and, so, and you're just like all happy smiles on your notes and stuff like that. Some of you are already there. Praise God. You might be so thankful you're annoying, but that's okay. <laughs> Keep it up. You, you know, you're, you're doing right. Now, if that's not you and you're full of something else, you struggle with complaining, you're always griping and being negative, and, and you are endlessly critical of everyone around you. Please practice gratitude. If you want to be content, practice gratitude. Uh, besides blessing the people you live with, there are two really good reasons for you to practice gratitude. Reason number one, you have much to be thankful for. Can I just tell you that? you got much to be thankful for. Think about this. you got God's love. 
We've been singing about it, talking about it. He loves you. We've already declared that. So you got God's love to be thankful for. God's mercy. You're not getting what you deserve. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been forgiven of your sins, and heaven is your ultimate destination. You will be content there, whether you like it or not. Okay? That's where you're headed. So, you know, all that stuff's taken care of. Besides all of the spiritual blessings, folks, just think about this. We live in the United States of America. Okay? You got a lot to be thankful for. Have you seen the rest of the world? This is a good place to be. Just saying that. So you got all this stuff. If you struggle with being, you know, grateful, then get a piece of paper and start writing stuff down that you were thankful for. If you get stuck after four or five things, because I've already named four or five things, then give me a call. We'll do lunch. I'll help you. Okay? You should be able to fill that paper up easily. So you have much to be thankful for. That's why you need to practice gratitude. Secondly, you need to practice gratitude because it is God's will for you. It's God's will. You know, the Bible doesn't use that phrase a whole lot. But let me tell you, one of the things it says clearly and plainly is that gratitude is God's will for us. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. This, This is a powerful verse. Paul is saying, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Wow. Rejoice, pray, be thankful. Rejoice, pray, be thankful. This is God's will for who? Yeah. It's God's will for you, for us, for everyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. God is really clear about this. This is what he wants you to do. We've already established that we all desire to live a life of contentment. Paul says we can do this. That I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So that means we have no excuses. I pray that you will choose contentment. Will you pray with me? Father, tonight we thank you. Thank you for your incredible gifts, for your incredible grace to us, for the fact that you love us and want us to be your your sons and daughters. And and God, you know how often we complain, how discontent we live our lives. You know that our desire is to grow in contentment. So God, convict us, teach us, open our eyes to see how we need to change our lives. Give us the courage to ask for help. Give us the courage to take those steps, as small as they may be that we might really, truly trust you and your plans, that we might embrace your priorities and we might be thankful. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our amazing God.